is Lou Dobbs tonight. Good evening, everybody. We are coming to you live from the, well, the very top of the Chamber of Commerce building in the nation's capital on this, the eve of Donald J. Trump's inauguration as our 45th president. It is a festive and extraordinary atmosphere in this, uh, in this town. The president-elect himself is in Washington today, taking part in a number of ceremonial events ahead of tomorrow's inauguration. Mr. Trump just moments ago addressing supporters at a welcome concert outside the Lincoln Memorial. We're going to make America great for all of our people, everybody, everybody throughout our country. That includes the inner cities. That includes everybody. And we're going to do a special job. We're counting down now to the inauguration with many of our favorite political analysts, among them Randy Evans, Matt Slap, Liz Peek, all with us. And tonight uh, joining us, Trump economic advisor Steve Moore and the leader of Trump's domestic transition team, Ken Blackwell. Republican lawmakers hard at work as well today, uh, just around the corner and from the Capitol, trying to get as many of Trump's cabinet members confirmed by the Senate as possible. But those Democrats are well, they're ornery. They're doing everything they can to slow walk what should be a very straightforward process. Well, there you have it. The uh, the battle uh, is is on. We'll have the latest on all of that. This political contest that is taking place even as the inaugural pomp and circumstance is underway, leading to the president-elect swearing in tomorrow at noon. President-elect Trump making his official arrival in Washington today on the eve of his inauguration. The, uh, the president-elect and the future first lady, Melania Trump, landing at Joint Base Andrews, trading in his luxury 757 aircraft, for a considerably more modest military version of Boeing C-32, part of the fleet of military aircraft that become Air Force One whenever the president is aboard. In a tweet earlier today, Trump said this. Getting ready to leave for Washington, D.C., the journey begins, and I will be working and fighting very hard to make it a great journey for the American people. I have no doubt that we will together make America great again. And this afternoon, Mr. Trump and Vice President-elect Pence participating in the wreath-laying ceremony at the Arlington National Cemetery at the tomb of the unknown soldier, the monument dedicated to service members whose remains have not been identified. And earlier today, Mr. Trump attended a leadership lunch and bringing together inaugural officials, top Republican leaders in Congress, his uh, nominees for his cabinet, and top members of the new White House team. He made reference to the location of the event, the Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C. What beautiful thing this is. Where is this? Where is this? This is a gorgeous <laughs> A total genius must have been this <laughs> under budget and ahead of schedule. <laughs> Well, coming shortly, Mr. Trump, Pence, and other officials scheduled to attend a candlelight dinner with campaign donors. So the uh, pomp and circumstance continuing through the evening. The party is on. And joining me now to talk about the latest columnist for the Fiscal Times, columnist Liz Peek, Matt Slap, chairman of the American Conservative Union. Good to have you both with us, and thanks for being with us. Uh, let me start, Liz, with you. Uh, this is a, a remarkable event today. It, the city is filled with a sense of change, I believe. Uh, there is, uh, it, when you look at the national media, you would think there was a, a, a great battle raging uh, between the, uh, the, the left and the right, and there is, but it's down <laughs> that way and then toward the Capitol. Uh, in nearly every other quarter of the city, there's an expectation of something much better ahead. Yeah, there's no question. It's a tremendously exciting atmosphere. Uh, I went to the mall this afternoon and watched some of the uh, welcome ceremony, which people were so excited to be there. At, at the, literally, at a, at a, at a picture of Donald Trump would show up, and they were all on their feet screaming and yelling. Uh, it's very exciting. And I think the flip side is it's a moment of uh, you know seriousness, and, and people are, I think, very interested to see what Donald Trump can do. This is a real change in the given order of politics in, in America. And I think 
you know, it's pretty fascinating. I was thinking today, looking back, it, you know, the first cabinet, after all, was not so dissimilar from what we have now, right? People of distinction, people who had become very successful, exactly. And all we hear from the Democrats is how terrible all that is. It's mm. like being a billionaire is like a disease you hope you don't catch. It's you know, it's I really catch kind of amazing. It. I know, I wouldn't it. mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. nor, would, nor would just about every American. Uh, it is, and it is the stuff of which the American dream uh, was constructed. That is the opportunity to hit it big, to provide at the very least for children who will have better lives. Under this administration that concludes at noon tomorrow, the Obama administration, that dream has been lost for so many millions of Americans, Matt. Uh, and there is the expectancy on the part of this president-elect that he will be able, and as he importantly says, we together will be able to make America great again. This, after hearing uh, the, in his last official uh, news conference, uh, the, uh, the president, uh, Mr. Obama, again, first person references 40 times. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. And Mr. Trump talking in terms of all of us. He is so inclusive in his That's language right. and his policies. It's a remarkable change. Uh, and I understand this is the this is the honeymoon moment, if there ever were one, uh, for Donald Trump uh, as he prepares to take the oath of office. Lou, I think it's appropriate that you're down in Washington uh, for this event. I just think it's wonderful. And I think it's just delicious that we're at the top of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I just had to say it one more time uh, for your viewers. Uh, maybe that says it all, that things are changing. Uh, but well, I, we I, care about commerce. I, I have to, <laughs> Matt is referring to the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable with whom I've had over the course of uh, the last decade and a half. Uh, considerable oh. uh, discussions about right. and arguments about uh, the proper uh, role for and the responsible role for corporate America and the, and, and their responsibility to protect and to to actually propel our middle class and all who aspire to it. Well, and, and, and Tom Donahue, who runs this place, being very generous to allow me even in the right. building. And to all of our faithful viewers, I just want to say I, I'm wearing my credentials today <laughs> to, to reassure everyone I'm not welcome quite in, in the nation's capital yet. Here in the swamp, I still need credentials to get in, and may it always be so, at least for me. That's right. The, I think, look, the, everything is being questioned. And what I love about this cabinet that you referred to is, is that not just Donald Trump, but many of the people he picked, in their confirmation hearings and just generally, there are these very fundamental and basic questions which people like me who are political junkies, mm -hmm. a lot of people are cynical and saying, why are they asking such basic questions? You know why? Because we've lost our way in almost every conceivable topic. And so if people are asking big questions about, hey, what's the federal government's role in this or that? I love it, and it's long overdue. I agree. And, and overdue, and there was a complete misreading by the Republicans as well as the Democrats in the election uh, of 2016. Uh, most of the Republican orthodoxy and elites were talking about, well, you know, the Republicans had better be embracing illegal immigration. They better get behind free trade at any cost. They better understand that this is a year in which you've got to be a sensitive, caring, uh, rope-a-dope uh, uh, phony. Uh, is a basically what they were calling for. And this becomes the year of Donald Trump. If you're talking about delicious irony, right. that is a wonderful irony, and it's one that Donald Trump exposed and changed the calculus for the next at least, I believe, uh, the next decade. I, I think that's totally true. Can you imagine what the conversation is like in Davos? I keep trying to think about <laughs> well, it's all the be, people there. It's going to be boring, I'll the, tell you. It, that. it is, but the topics are things like, you know, how did this happen? And I don't think they have anyone there who actually was involved in it's happening. They're trying are there to any interpret. Are there any deplorables at Davos? I, just <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, it really is kind of comical, right? Uh, well, they are completely opposed to everything that's going on. You know, Anthony Scaramucci, I happen to run into him, who is one of the uh, senior advisors to Donald Trump. He was in Davos, uh, met uh, Kareli, the, uh, the Russian sovereign uh, fund uh, manager. Uh, and because of their meeting immediately, the left decided that this was a violation of sanctions against Russia to even have a discussion uh, in, in, that may not have amounted to much more than how are you, I'm fine, how are you, Dimitri, to quote, uh, <laughs> to quote Dr. Strangelove, one of my favorite movies uh, in which uh, <laughs> you know, 
the president uh, and the, the premier of uh, the Soviet Union then go about asking each other how, uh, how they are. I digress, no question about that. But going after Scaramucci because right. he did this. I, I mean, this is hypocrisy. This, well, and I asked Anthony his reaction, and he said, you know, this is the real swamp here is that this kind of uh, venal, and these are my words, not his, but this ven venal, mendacious uh, exploitation of a moment for pure ideological and partisan purposes on the part of the left is reprehensible. Yet, it persists and it is an important part of the swamp that's got to be drained. You that's can right. see it because look at the optimism now rising about business sentiment and consumer sentiment and all that stuff hitting nine year, 10 year highs. And yet Donald Trump's personal ratings are not very good. Why? Because the media has not given up on this daily assault yeah. on everything. Look, to do look, with I've Donald been following Trump. politics a long time. Those polls on personal characteristics don't matter. You know what's off the chart? 66 percent. Donald Trump's approach on the issues. Yeah. If he sticks to what he's going to do on scale, the issues, yeah. it'll work. In the latest Gallup poll, it, it's remarkable to see his improvement in each of those uh, each of those elements. Uh, and you're right. I, and I think we should remind everyone. Remember this. These polls are the same pollsters who right. were polling into November 8th, and they were dead wrong. They haven't improved that much in this short time. I, I'm sorry to report, <laughs> but I do think it's important to note. Uh, we're, go we're going to talk a little bit more about fake news, but we got to run. Great to see you, Liz. Thanks so thank much, you. Matt. Thanks thank you. Me. All Thanks, the best. Liz. Happy inaugural. Yes, it's good indeed. to have you here. Time to celebrate. Thank you. I love to visit. <laughs> we're just hours away from President-elect Trump's inauguration. And here in D.C., a massive security operation, of course, has been put in place. Law enforcement officials are taking special precaution ahead of all of these festivities, with several scheduled demonstrations expected as well. Uh, Fox News Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge is live now with our report. Catherine, this is a very, very big area with, <laughs> with hundreds of thousands of people to watch over. Your report. Well, that's right, Lou. Uh, security is intense because of the protests and a dynamic threat where cars, trucks and drones can be used as weapons. Tonight, Fox News is the only television network reporting live from the Multi-Agency Communications Center, or MAC, that oversees the entire security operation. I'm just going to step aside so you can take a wider look at the room. You can see the MAC is already up and running and fully operational. And if you look closely, you can see these individual workstations. Stations. There are 47, one for each agency that's intimately involved in the security plan. They are literally working side by side, sharing information. And if there is a specific incredible threat or an incident, there's an intelligence surge that comes into this communication center so that key decisions can be made. During this inauguration, there will be a hardened security perimeter. They will be using trucks with salt, sand, and cement. And this is a direct response to these ISIS-inspired terrorist plots in France and more recently Germany, where terrorists used trucks as weapons to mow down civilians. Secret Service has also been doing drills with drones. In this scenario, the drone has been weaponized. It can disperse a chemical agent or an explosive over the crowd. You cannot fly drones in D.C. airspace, and the Secret Service says they have the ability to detect them and bring them down. What concerns you most? Everything concerns me. It's a constant battle of making sure that we've stayed in front of uh, certainly the intelligence that we hear, but also uh, any new emerging threats that uh, may be out there. So the MAC is going to be up and running through the very last event uh, for the inauguration on Saturday when then President Trump returns to the White House, Lou. Catherine, thank you very much. An extraordinary operation here in the streets as you walk the streets of Washington, D.C. today. Uh, well under control, I assure you. Up next, fireworks today at the confirmation hearings for Donald Trump's cabinet choices. This part of Steve Mnuchin, who is uh, Donald Trump's choice to lead the Treasury Department. This is just a part of what he went through today at his hearing. Senator Wyden, uh, I've got a Valium pill here that you might want to take before the second round. Uh, 
That was Senator uh, Pat uh, Roberts uh, uh, admonishing uh, the, uh, the members of the Senate, uh, especially Ron Wyden, the senator from Oregon, who was getting very exercised in his questioning. Uh, we'll be taking that up with Randy Evans here next. We're coming to you live from the nation's capital for Donald Trump's presidential inaugural. Stay with us. We'll be right back with much more. Two more confirmation hearings today for President-elect Trump's cabinet, Steve Mnuchin for Treasury Secretary, former Texas Governor Rick Perry for Secretary of Energy. Mnuchin defended his financial past when pressed by some of the senators whether he took advantage during the home foreclosure crisis. Mnuchin said nothing could be farther from the truth. Perry, meanwhile, sidestepped controversy, or at least tried to, address his 2011 remarks saying he would abolish the Energy Department. My past statements made over five years ago about abolishing the Department of Energy do not reflect my current thinking. In fact, after being briefed on so many of the vital functions of the Department of Energy, I regret recommending its elimination. Joining me now, former senior advisor to the Newt Gingrich presidential campaign, Randy Evans. Uh, good to have you with us. Thank you for being here. You are having me here. You, you've been uh, you've been busy traveling and uh, getting a lot done. I know uh, just and, a little. And I'm I'm sure you've been watching every moment of this. I'd say today's festivities uh, all went splendidly. I think I think the confirmation proceedings are exceeding every expectation, Lou. Only because the American people are actually getting to hear people talk common sense and say every now and then. Hey, I changed my mind. I think I, I heard the data. I now listen to it, right. and I listen to the merits of the argument. That's why I keep telling you we're going to see a contrast between the politics of personal destruction, where they go after people personally, and the politics of merit, where people talk about what they actually think. All right, let me give you a quick uh, repost to that. Sure, if I may. Uh, I listened to Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, and, and I think you know, start his nonsense about a, a, a swamp cabinet. I, I start thinking about, well, maybe pinching his nose or, you know, tweaking his ear. I, I thought to myself, it's a swamp Senate panel here. When the Democrats decide that they're going to boycott the, uh, the inauguration, what would that be? I mean, literally, the swamp gets up and leaves? Yeah. Uh, that's kind of what we had, at, what were happening here. I mean, they started with partisanship when they passed the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. They end with partisanship, saying they're going to walk out on the inauguration. They have confirmation hearings, which are largely and purely among partisan lines refusing to actually even listen to the answers I, I want to get I'm going to I'm asking my producers now I'm, I'm, I'm producing on the air uh, so folks if you would get that sound bite that exchange between Senator Al Franken uh, and, and Governor Rick Perry because it is a priceless moment in the midst of this swamp uh, as Randy uh, is saying and the contention uh, the venality uh, the mendaciousness of some of these sinners as they attack uh, president elect Trump's nominees. Uh, so, if, can we have that? Uh, is, and let me know. Uh, uh, do, do we have it ready? All right, Lou. I got a yes. I got a yes and a no. <laughs> can I say this to you, though? You had to think to yourself when Donald Trump said, I'm going to drain the swamp, and you watch the Democrats abandon the inauguration. My God, he is draining the swamp. There they go, right off the stage, right off the inauguration. Well, we're going to we're going to uh, bring them back for a return appearance here. How, how soon can we have it, folks? If I can ask. Uh, so we'll have it here in a. Well, Donald Trump has called uh, CNN fake news, and CNN is under fire for a, a shocking segment uh, that it uh, aired on an assassination scenario, a scenario uh, involving the president-elect. The Situation Room, the program hosted by Wolf Blitzer, airing this, uh, this report from contributor Brian Todd with a headline reading, quote, developing now disaster could put Obama cabinet member in Oval Office. Here's part of it. Tonight, due to a quirk in America's rules for succession, questions remain about just who would be in charge if an attack hit the incoming president, vice president, and congressional leaders just as the transfer of power is underway. If the president and vice president are killed or incapacitated, next in line is the House Speaker, then the president pro tempore of the Senate. But what if something happened to them at the inauguration, too? 
After that, it goes down the list of cabinet secretaries, starting with Secretary of State. And there is, a, well, a shameful irony in all of this. CNN has just posted a job advertisement looking for a reporter to cover what they describe as a wave of fake news. We know where much of their coverage, obviously, will take place. Joining me now, Washington Times opinion editor Charlie Hurt, Washington Examiner chief political correspondent Byron York. Uh, and, and let me start, uh, Charlie, with you. Uh, I have never seen anything like that, uh, so insensitive, so repugnant. Uh, I can't even imagine CNN, no matter the depths of its ideological depravity, stooping to such a low. Yeah, I consider myself a, a bit of a, uh, a connoisseur of bad reporting and reckless reporting and uh, <laughs> what you might call fake news from, from uh, you know, established, uh, highly regarded outfits like the New York Times. And I can tell you, I have never in my life seen anything as reckless and uh, stupid and uh, dangerous and uh, misguided as that, and what's re as that CNN report. And I have to say that what's really terrifying about this is it is such an explosive, it's such a dangerous thing that they put out there, that their own the, the report a reporter didn't come up with this. Wolf Blitzer didn't come up with this. This came from the top. That's the only way somebody at CNN could have gotten away with doing this, because if somebody else had thought of it, Jeff Zucker would have thrown them out of his office and said, are you insane? And so, uh, you know, the, you can only assume that this must have been Zucker's idea. What, what do you think, Byron? Do you think uh, it comes from the top, and what are your personal reactions? Well, this is something that, that you have to be really, really careful about. I mean, when, when you're on television, uh, generally, in, in the news, the business, the, the, the idea has been, if you, if you talked about the assassination of a president, it was because somebody had been arrested, maybe a plot had been uncovered. There was some actual There news. has to be a premise. You don't just make it up. And, and they, they, they just made up this entire uh, scenario about this on this inauguration day. We'd have to go back and check and see if they'd ever done something like this before. Uh, but it was really extraordinary. Well, that would only give them a history of poor judgment and, and, and reckless, reckless uh, uh, conduct. I, I mean, this is so awful that it, I can't imagine the board of Time Warner, uh, those executives at Time Warner, tolerating exactly. this nonsense. And, and, and to your point, Charlie, this is, this is the stuff of which careers should be uh, interrupted. Uh, and, and whoever is responsible for it, and ultimately that has to be Jeff Zucker. He, he, he would, this didn't go on the air. I think you're exactly right, Charlie. Without, without approval. And, and and remember, the end of the story was somehow the Obama administration would just kind of stay in power uh, if this were to be the case, because we don't have a Republican Secretary of State, which is where the line of succession goes after President, Vice President, uh, Speaker House, and, and uh, President Pro Tem of the Senate. That was kind of but, the end scenario, but, was that the, the Obama administration doesn't have to give up power. Right. And when, and when I got to that part of the story, I have to say, it made me wonder, well, is CNN in cahoots with Chuck Schumer and Democrats, and that's why they didn't confirm any of his uh, secretaries before now? That sounds yeah. preposterous, and I'm embarrassed to even say it, but my goodness, the, when we're dealing with facts or fake news like this, uh, you know, what, what are we left to, to, to believe? Well, and, and the hiring uh, of Valerie Jarrett, uh, daughter, yeah. as the Justice Department correspondent, who has never reported before, and specifically the decided management that uh, she would be perfect for the Trump Justice Department. Well, you know uh, that in the past there has been a little bit of a revolving door between political offices and the press, and most of it is Democrats uh, going into the uh, into the media. Some of them have had uh, great careers, like Tim Russert, who had worked for a Democrat long before he went to NBC. Uh, but there's there know, may be three examples where well, that has worked. Well, pick George Stephanopoulos. The, That's two. Probably the most partisan <laughs> warrior in yeah. the Clinton administration in and, the beginning of, of it. And, and many and many would argue that, that he is also one of the most partisan warriors sitting uh, behind a news desk Could at a major that. network. Charlie, you get the last word. Well, it, I, you know, who knows what CNN is up to right now? But uh, but it does strike me that they're kind of it's almost like they're the Democrats in that. Uh, they're so desperate. They're so they're struggling for for uh, relevance that they're willing to sort of go out there and say anything and do anything just to get attention. Well, attention they've gotten, and now yeah, we'll see indeed. what the consequences are. Charlie Hurt, thanks for being with us. Byron York, thank you, sir. Appreciate you. it.
Nelson to have you here. Up next, Vice President-elect Pence telling reporters today the transition process came in on time and under budget with 20% of taxpayer funding going right back to the U.S. Treasury. When's the last time that happened? He's a businessman that knows how to sharpen his pencil, and I'm very pleased to report today that we were able to do that um, and, uh, and, and restore those dollars to the Treasury. Trump economics advisor Steve Moore joins us here next. We're live in the nation's capital. Donald J. Trump tomorrow becomes the 45th president of the United States, and there is a direct correlation between that event and our presence here in the swamp. Stay with us. We're coming right back. We're coming to you live tonight from our nation's capital ahead of the inauguration of our 45th president. Mr. Trump wasted no time in draining the swamp. He's looking to cut ten and a half trillion dollars in government spending over the next decade. That, according to a report in The Hill, which says the president-elect and his team are proposing dramatic funding cuts as well as eliminating programs in a number of departments, including commerce and energy. Well, joining me now, Trump campaign economics advisor Steve Moore. Steve, great to have you here. A great night. Hello. A great uh, well, uh, day. This is so awesome. Thank you for inviting me on the show. What a, what a view we've got here. It's, uh, it, it's our pleasure, and I'll tell you, we couldn't have imagined, uh, uh, what, a year and a half ago, uh, that this would be where we would be. Uh, well, we could have imagined. Or that you have both a presidential we, candidate that's, I mean, uh, an incoming president. <laughs> that would want to cut $10 trillion out of the budget over the next right. 10 years. And that's very possible. It's plausible. It has to be done if we're going to do the... How about cutting 20% from uh, the government uh, payrolls? Uh, you see, one-third of the federal employees have said that they're going to walk out. So you just got so one-third right just, there. You just you know, it, it's easy. You uh, got, a, got a bonus of 13%. Right. But uh, look, this is serious stuff. Uh, Republicans want to cut taxes. They want to increase spending on the military and on infrastructure. That means almost everything else, Lou, is going to have to get cut, and it's about time. I mean, there was a report just a couple of months ago by the federal government's own auditors, mm -hmm. 165 billion, not million, 165 billion of erroneous and fraudulent payments every year under Medicaid, Social Security, Medicare, food stamps, what would you say? and no one ever does anything about it. Well, and it was a few years ago. It was two hundred billion was the yeah. best estimate. I guess we've improved a yeah. little bit. So there's there's an improvement, but it's still one hundred and sixty five billion dollars. The problem dollars. is there isn't a person. I I doubt that there are many people. I should say, watching and listening to us here tonight, who don't know that this government doesn't work. Everyone knows that, that except the people here. Well, yeah, that's the, been the problem. Those and uh, all of the folks who are supporting it uh, on K Street. Yes. Oops, we're saying this in the. Right. In We're in I Street, so it's right over there. <laughs> We're saying that right, right here uh, on the ceiling. Well, this uh, will be the test of, uh, no, of this, the Chamber of Commerce. This will be the test of Donald Trump, whether he has the metal and the spine to go after K Street. It's been I've been here for 30 years. He, Ronald Reagan tried it; he couldn't do it. You know, uh, Bill. We're Clinton talking about tried a different. We're talking about a different fellow. Oh, that's I, I, I will make you any bet you want at any level. Donald Trump won't back off. I hope you're right. There's no back. I, I haven't right. seen any backup in the man right. whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I think one of the great <laughs> the great mysteries here is the number of people in this town who can't figure out one reality about Donald Trump, his personality, uh, his character. To this point, before taking the oath of office, he is working to deliver on his promises. Yes. I, I mean, you've never yeah. seen that. And you know, when I, I, and I include Ronald Reagan, by the way, in that. Uh, it, and I, no one could be a bigger fan of him. Uh, than you I. know, let, I'll tell you a quick story. You know, when I was coming over here, all the all the roads are closed here, so I had to take the metro. I got, and there's so many, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of people around, and people were just coming up to me all over the place. You know, they've seen right. me on Fox News, and they were embracing me, and they said, "Make sure Donald Trump says what he's going to do." I met this little old lady from Rhode Island. I didn't even know there were, were Republicans in Rhode Island, and she was so excited, and she said, "You know, we've got to get." Get this done, drain the swamp. So the American people behind Donald Trump, you're right, sure. he's going to be fighting everybody in this town. And you make it sound easier than it is, though, Lou. Well, I, this I, is going to be extraordinary. It's like extracting wisdom teeth in this town to cut the budget. I, I, I tell you part of the reason, I don't mean to suggest yeah. it's easy at all. But what I do mean to suggest to you and to everyone is Donald Trump is an exceptional leader. He is. He's an exceptional man. And these people, frankly, this is not a fair fight right now. 
Yeah, I mean, it really is not. The number of billionaires and uh, friends of Donald Trump who told me, for example, oh, Donald Trump can't do this uh, when he Thank was you. running for office. I've been friends with him forever, but you know, this is just beyond his too, about this or whatever. Every one of them right now is trying to find out a way to say, hey, Don, good to see you, buddy. We've been pals forever. And they're trying but they to want something. That's they exactly, want something. They want something. Exactly it. That's they're right. trying to insinuate yeah, their right, way right, in. Right. And I don't think it's working for them. You know, I, I hope you're right about that. You know, I, when you drain the swamp, that means you have to drain the special interest influence in this town. You have to do it through the tax the tax changes. We want to get rid of the deductions loopholes. You have to do it through the spending. You've got to do it through a lot of these regulations. And by the way, the trade stuff, too. we got all these special interest provisions and the trade provisions. You know, let's make it a level playing field so everybody is, uh, you know. Think about where we were a year and a half ago as a country before Donald Trump a little over a year and a half ago, before he entered the race. He set the agenda, talking about illegal immigration and trade, talking about yep. trade in real terms, right. talking about bringing jobs back. Every one of the hacks in the national left-wing media said, oh, he's done. full of it, he can't do this. Not just the left-wing media, well, I the right-wing media I, said it. I was about to start work on the <laughs> right-wing right media yeah. as well, who think, well, first of all, most of them are under contract to corporate America. Right. Uh, and people need to, you know, but there's this, I think he's reignited a spirit that you know, it's going to I've be never seen anything like it. I'm so excited. I, I just want I want Trump to gallop out of the gates on Monday. I want him to start. There was a rumor that he might start signing these executive orders when he was in the limousine going down Pennsylvania Avenue tomorrow, repealing a lot of these orders that Obama's put in place. I and the have, American people will, will cheer him if he does that. Uh, I think there is no doubt. And uh, I certainly would be amongst those. Ten points, trillion so. of cuts over ten years. We haven't seen anything like that. It can be done. Only a businessman who knows how to match revenues with spending, an alien concept in this town, could pull that up. I, I, I agree with you, and it's really funny to see the Chinese move from warning Donald Trump about his uh, exuberance to do the right thing for the American people, too. Uh, maybe we can work it out. We don't want a trade war to the Europeans who are acknowledging now they don't know what the hell they're doing and are paying stiff penalties for their uh, their statism. Lou, one other, one last Real point. quick. I think he's going to face the stiffest resistance is going to come from a lot of from the Republicans. They don't want to cut the budget either. You mean Paul Ryan? Well, just the Do you mean Paul Ryan? <laughs> no, I mean just everybody. I'm not naming names here. But Republicans, I do. Senate, I do. they don't want to cut the budget. I'll take care of that part. They I'll say do. they do, but they don't. Yeah, I know. But you know what? You can lead a horse to water. You've got it. All right. You got it. This man can. See more. It's great to Thanks, see you, Lou. and congratulations, a special evening uh, for you, working so hard to uh, to bring policy into line. I had the time of my life with this guy. He is Definitely. he is a different political leader than I've ever seen in my life. You Super. Bet. We appreciate everything Thank you're you, doing. See more. Well, up next, the U.S. military conducting airstrikes in Libya on President Obama's final day in office. We'll talk about the drastic changes ahead in foreign policy. Ambassador John Bolton joins me next. We're in Washington, D.C. This is our special coverage of Donald Trump's inauguration. It doesn't get much better than that. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Joining me now, the former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations American Enterprise Institute Senior Fellow, John Bolton. Great to have you with us. And let's, let's, I mean, as all of this is happening in the nation's capital, uh, it is almost it's so difficult to think of all that the new president will face in the way of challenges in foreign policy, uh, including Russia. Uh, including the Islamic State. Uh, I want to get your reaction to a number of those issues. Uh, and let's begin uh, with the Islamic State, which uh, Barack Obama, uh, and I apologize for the helicopters, uh, but they, they're, they're on the way for us. So. <laughs> well, they're on their way for whoever might want to uh, cross any kind of line here. Uh, it's amazing, the security here, and it's uh, deeply reassuring. Uh, but a striking ISIS on the last day of your presidency in this manner, what's the, what's the signal here? Well, I think it's one more effort by the outgoing administration to try and structure their reputation. If there was information about these targets before, they should have been attacked when the information reached the point where they could make a decision. To wait this late, 
uh, strikes of theater. I hope that's not right. Our people are at risk whenever you go on a mission like that, even with stealth aircraft. Uh, and I hope they got their targets. But but I agree, it's very hard to justify it on the 